Um, it, it, is a, it is a great day. Happy New Year. And um, I, I do love the, the new year. It is, for me, um, kind of like a, I, I just love the, the brand new feel to it. Um, it here, here's three ways I would describe it. It feels like a brand new notebook, right? Uh, is there any better feeling than opening up a brand new notebook and you get to write on those first few pages? Or how about this? Go back to elementary school and you remember when you got to open up that brand new box of crayons for the very first time and, and you got to get that out and you got to do that? Or here we go. Here's, here's the other way is how many of y'all love being the first person to open the jar of peanut butter and you see that smooth top right there and you're like, I get to take the first spoonful out of this thing, all right? That, that's how a brand new f- year kind of feels, right? All kinds of, of possibilities. There's this freshness to it. And so, in fact, that might be why you're here today is because it's like, man, I want 2024 to be different than 2023. And so I'm going to start going to church maybe for the very first time. Uh, maybe it's like, I got it. We got to get back to going to church. And so if so, man, we are so glad to have you here today. And we are excited to see what the Lord is going to do over the course of this, this next year. And uh, that's why we're starting this brand new sermon series that is just called Habits, Small Disciplines, Big Differences. Okay. What are the small things that we can do that we can add? Add to our lives that will make big differences in the re- in the rest and in, in, in our in the, over the course of our lives. And I got to tell you, I am super excited about this because you talk about the idea of habits, routines, uh, rhythms, you know, what, how, whatever you want to call them. It's something that I could just talk about for days because it has just made such a huge impact on my life, and I know it will on yours as well. And so, for the next few weeks, we're going to be just spending some time. I'm just talking about these ideas. And so um, I want to give you a few resources to check out real quick. We'll throw them up here on the screen. Uh, Here are three books incredibly helpful for this idea. First is called uh, The Power of Habits uh, by Charles Duhigg. Um, I think that was written in like 2012, was really like the classic book on habits um, until James Clear came along and wrote Atomic Habits, I think in 2018. And that became like the the bestseller. It's been like the number one seller, especially in the month of January, um, every year since he put that book out. And then the last book is called Power to Change, and that's written by a pastor, Craig Groeschel. And uh, we have those available in our next step resource room out the the door and to uh, my left. at, yeah, there to the left. And um, I've worked through that book with a couple of groups that I lead. And every guy that I've had read that book, they're just like, this book is amazing. Okay. So you will not be disappointed if you pick that up. And so I also tell you that so that if you do pick up those books or you've already read those books and you hear something in that, in one of these messages over the next four weeks, it's like, Hey, didn't Adam say that on stage? Oh yeah, that's where I got it. Okay. I'm just telling you that right now. There's so much good stuff out there on this topic and those books you will not be disappointed in. So let's start off the message which is asking this question. And it's this, why do habits matter? Okay, why, why even spend time talking about this? Why do these matter so much? And the answer, if you wanna put it into a concise statement is this, it's because successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. All right, let me, let me say that again. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. And you take whatever area or arena of life that you want to get into, you can talk about faith, relationships, finances, um, health, whether that's emotional, spiritual, physical health, um, you name it. People who are successful in those areas of life are people who do consistently the things that other people only do occasionally. And so it's all about the small things that lead in the direction of big things over time, the small habits that lead to big differences over time. And I think that if you go to the life of Jesus, you see this play out even in his life. In fact, have you ever pondered and asked yourself this question? How did Jesus not go crazy? All right, have you ever thought about this? With all the needs and all the things that people wanted from him, just the amount of needy people that were around Jesus, like this person needs healing, they need food, disciples still don't get it, Peter gets on his nerves. You know, how come there is never a moment in the Gospels to where you see Jesus just lose his ever loving mind and it's go, all right, everybody, time out, just get out of the room, I need to be by myself? I think that Luke gives us two clues 
in chapters four and chapter five that kind of give us just like a baseline of just two small habits that Jesus had that helped him be able to continue to live the life that he needed to live. Luke chapter four, verse 16, this is what it says. It says, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. Now say this next phrase with me, you guys ready? He went into the synagogue as was his custom. Oh, another way that you could phrase that is as was his what? His habit, as was his rhythm, as was his routine, as was his just normal way of living. You flip over another chapter, and in Luke chapter 5, Luke says this, and he says, but Jesus, say those next two words with me, but Jesus often withdrew, okay? So this is his habit. What is he doing? He's withdrawing to lonely places and praying. So what Luke does is he gives us an insight into these like two keystone habits of Jesus' life to where he is regularly going to church, and regularly going off and spending time with his father. And if anyone could have made the excuses, it would have been Jesus. I mean, if anybody could have said, I don't need to go to church, I already know what the preacher's going to say, it's Jesus, right? I mean, he is the author of scripture. He's like, I already know what's going to be said. I don't need to be there. If there's anybody who could have made the excuse, I really don't have time to get away and pray because I got this line of people who need me to heal them of their diseases. I just, I got more important things to do. It would have been Jesus, but he just never said those things. Instead, what we see is he had a consistent habit. He would gather with God's people. He would break away from the noise. He would break away from the crowd to be with his heavenly father. Why? Well, what do successful people do? They do consistently what other people do occasionally. Author Sean Covey put it this way. He says, our habits will make or break us. We become what we repeatedly do. Let me say that again, because that's, that's really, really good. Our habits will make or break us. We become what we repeatedly do. Do. Now, here's why we're doing this series to start off the, the beginning of the year. Many of us have made or, or we're looking at the new year as a chance to turn over a new leaf, as an opportunity to make changes in our lives. Uh, many of us are even a part of the population that's made like resolutions. Maybe you have written down goals or resolutions that are there. Many of us are saying we want this year to be different than what last year was like. But the problem is, is that most of us are going to fail. In fact, what they find whenever it comes to New Year's resolutions, 91% of us fail at our New Year's resolutions by the end of March, and most of us by Valentine's Day. In fact, it's almost become just like a standing joke. There is now a national day of ditch New Year's resolution day. Okay, Uh, Do you want to know what day it is? January 17th. All right, we're like 17 days. That's far enough for us to, to go. We don't need to do that. But we do. We make these lofty, big goals, and you know what they are. It's like, I want to stop smoking. I want to exercise more. I want to lose some weight, relax more, quit drinking, get organized, get out of debt, spend more time with my family. But the problem is, generally speaking, what happens is at the end of this year, you'll look back, if you don't make changes, and you'll say, it's just the same as the year before, just another trip around the sun, same old, same old, still doing the same things. In fact, Romans 7 could almost be a life verse for some of us. Remember, the Apostle Paul says this, I don't really understand myself. Can anybody amen that? He says, yeah, amen, I don't understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate, and I I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So what what is the answer? What is our hope? Where does our power come from? Well, it's not our willpower. It's the power of the Spirit in us. It's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's where we're kind of moving throughout these next few weeks. And so my hope and my prayer is that as we begin this new year, is that you will experience the life available to you in Jesus Christ, and that you would live out the disciplines, the rhythms, and the habits that lead to a God-honoring and pleasing life, because the path to wisdom is paved with discipline.
Okay, so today, here's what we're going to do, is we're going to ask this question in the rest of our time, and let's just explore, why do we generally fail? Okay, why do we generally fail whenever it comes to making these changes in our lives? Uh, next week, we're going to talk about how we can start new habits. The week after that, we're going to talk about how we can stop the habits we don't want to have anymore. And then the last week, we'll talk about how it's not our willpower, but the spirit power. Okay, but today is why do we generally fail? And let me give you three reasons. Reason number one is this, is because we focus on the outcome and we ignore the process. We focus on the outcome and we ignore the process. We focus on the thing that we want to accomplish, but we don't understand the steps that it's going to take to get there. And many of us, we have similar goals. In fact, if, if we did a survey, if we were able to just do a real quick survey and say, what is most important to you? I mean, all of the answers would probably start to fall into the, generally the same categories. I mean, you know, there'd be people that say, it's like, I want to be, be healthy, right? I, I just want to be healthy. There'd be probably nobody has walked in this year and said, you know what my goal is, is I want to have the highest cholesterol that my doctor has ever seen, right? I want them to marvel that I'm able to stand up straight. You know, they're like, how is even blood getting to your brain. We have no idea how you are. You are a marvel of science, right? Nobody says that. You know, people are like, well, I, I want to have, you know, better relationships. You know, people don't walk in and say, I hope to be more alone and more isolated, and I hope to alienate every single one of my family members because of the election this year. You know, that nobody comes in and says, that's my goal. It's like, financially, I want to I be free from debt. That's what we say. Nobody says, you know what? I hope at the end of 2024, I have doubled my credit card debt, paying 23.99%, and I am overdrafted on every account that I have. No, nobody says these things. Okay? Nobody walks in and says, I hope that I'm farther away from God next year than I was the year before. We all have the same goals, but not everyone experiences the same results. Why is this? Well, this is where James Clear and Atomic Habits can kind of give us some help here. He says that, you know, that winners and losers, successful and unsuccessful people, that they all have the same goals. Like you, you take a, in, in sports, you take a football team, every football team starts off with the same goal, right? Every, not a single coach walks into his locker room, you know, the first day of spring practice and says, boys, we're shooting for fifth this year. Okay, unless you're Georgia Tech. All right. <laughs> We're aiming high. We're aiming high. You know, whenever it comes to marriage, everybody says we want to go death until death do us part. Nobody says, you know, like, you know I hope we get a good five to seven years. You know, if we can get a good five to seven years, have some fun times, and then divide our stuff, you know, 50-50 at the end and never speak to each other again, then we'll feel great. Nobody sets that out as a goal. We all have similar goals, but we get different results. Why? Listen to James Clear. He says, goals don't determine success. Systems determine success. Goals don't get us the end result. Systems do. In fact, here's a direct quote from him. He says, you don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. Let me say that again. This is so important to understand. You don't rise to the level of your goals. You can have the loftiest goals in the world. You fall to the level of your systems. In the Bible, we see this clearly in the life of, of Daniel. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at him next week. But here's a guy with great faith who stood, fall, who stood tall in the face of adversity. But where does it all begin? It doesn't begin with a goal of him wanting to be faithful. It begins with his system. For years, he had pre-decided that three times every single day, he was going to pray and to seek the face of God, and he was going to spend time with God himself. It was systematic. It was pre-planned. It was a habit. And that's how he got to where he needed to be. See, what we do is we think, I need to change the results. I need to lose 20 pounds. I need to get more organized. I need to pay off debt. And those things may likely be something that needs to happen in your life, but we have to change the systems that cause the results. Because if you fix the system, the results will change. You want to hear more about that, right? Okay, that's next week. So come back next couple of weeks here. Okay, but the reason, number one, why we generally fail is we focus on the outcome and ignore the process. Here's reason number two, is we want results now, right? We want to see it happen. We give up quickly because results take time. 
Because here's what's going to happen. You're going to look at it, and you're going to go, you know, I went to the gym four times this week. I ate clean. Um, I only had ice cream once this week, you know, and then you step on the scale at the end of the week, and you gain four pounds, you know, or it's like I read my Bible every day. I had perfect attendance for the first three weeks at church, and, and yet I yelled at my kids on the way in the church parking lot. You know, we didn't go out to eat for a month. I made all my coffee at home. I started a meal plan, and we saved $150, and we put it towards the student loan. And, and now the student loan that had a $35,500 balance has a balance of 35350 We don't see results happen fast enough. So what happens is we get discouraged, and we make a mental mistake. This is the mental mistake. We make a conclusion that small, good decisions don't matter. That doing the right thing, small as it may be, will never make a, a big difference. And yet we, we, we flip it, and we end up doing the same thing. You know, you, you skip church for a weekend. You don't read your Bible for a week, and it's like, well, my life didn't fall apart. Um, you eat an entire box of Intamin's chocolate donuts that they always are putting on, buy one, get one free. And you eat an entire box in a week, and you're like, well, I didn't gain 20 pounds this week. You go play golf with your friends for the fifth straight weekend, even though you haven't taken your wife out on a date for six months. And she's not happy, but she didn't leave you. And we make the same conclusion, don't we? That small, bad decisions don't really impact my life that much. So the thought process is this. Small, good decisions don't really move the needle. And small, bad decisions don't really move the needle one way or the other. But the truth is, and, and don't miss this, who you are today is a result of every small decision you've made along the way. They all matter, and they all add up. Very rarely do you wreck your life all at once. It is always small decisions made over time that end up adding up and making the difference. So your hard work, the discipline that you're trying to add, the sacrifices, your faithfulness, they are not being wasted they are not being wasted. You don't want to know what's happening? They are being stored up. That's what's happening with them. I love Zechariah 4.10. It says, do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. That's what he rejoices in. He sees the small things going on, this process taking place in your life. He loves seeing the work begin, and this process takes time. I mean, I want you to think about it like this. Let's say you put a kettle on the stove, and you're going to get some water to boil. Maybe you're going to make some oatmeal. You're going to make some tea, or you're going to boil some, some water to make some rice. And, and you put that water on the stove, and you crank the heat up, and you turn it on to high. And what happens is you just sit there, and you watch that water. And what you can't see happening is that the temperature is rising. And as the temperature is rising, the energy is storing up, and it moves from 80 degrees to 90 degrees to 100 degrees to 110 degrees to 140 degrees to 170 degrees. And on the surface, it looks like nothing is happening. Nothing is going on. And then it hits 190. It hits 200. It hits 211. And still, it looks like nothing is taking place. But then it hits that last degree, and it hits 212. And what happens? happens to that water, boom, it starts to boil. The energy that's been storing up and it starts to tip out and then the tipping point hits and it's just starting to roll and to roll and to roll. Listen to me. The decisions that you are making are storing up energy. The small habits that you are adding, these faithful things. Yeah, you fail, but you get back up and you keep going. Repent, you keep moving on. And these small little things, a God-honoring faithfulness, a God-honoring discipline, a God-honoring habit, and you keep adding those and adding those and adding those. And over time, as the work begins, the energy stores up. And listen, I promise you, at some point, boom, 212 is going to happen in your life. And all of a sudden, it's going to go, people are going to go, oh my goodness, he's in shape now. How did they get out of debt? Look at that marriage that they have. Those are incredible parents. Oh my goodness, what a deep spirituality that person carries around. It's like it all just happened overnight. 
But you're going to sit there and go, oh, my goodness. That didn't take overnight. That took a long time for all that energy to be stored up before it finally tipped over. Galatians 6.9 says this, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. But what's the key to that phrase? If we do not give up. And so for some of y'all, I just want to encourage you right now. You've been trying for a while. And you've been working with your kids, or you've been working on your marriage, you've been working on your finances, you've been working on your health, and, and you're weary, you're tired, you're just about to give up. Can I just throw this out here? What if you're at 200 degrees? What if you're at 205? What if you're at 209? What if you're at 211? Do you really want to walk away at 211 degrees and just give up whenever that tipping point is just right there? Don't give up. Don't grow weary, for in due time, you will reap a harvest. So why do we generally fail? Well, the first reason is, is because we focus on the outcome and not the process. Second reason is, is we're impatient. We want results now. The third reason is this. We don't know who we really are. We don't know who we really are. A distorted identity can sabotage our hopes of success. Now, friends, I'm, I'm your friend. I'm here to help you. And one of the ways that I can help you is just to make sure you're informed of something. Um, you have an enemy. And if you don't know this, we have an enemy. He is the devil. He is Satan. And one of his primary attacks against all of us is an attack of identity. And if you hang around Corinth Christian Church long enough, um, this is one of those areas you're going to find that we really try to help us in, is that we just, we want you to know, we want all of us to just be secure in our identity in Christ, helping us understand who God says you are and not what your enemy says. Because the enemy, what he does is he tells you who you are not. He will focus on accusations. In fact, listen to Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. It says, For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night. It's day and night. He does not stop. He does not relent. And one of the primary ways he will accuse you is he will connect your failures to your identity. You failed, therefore you are a failure. You did something bad, therefore you are bad. He's going to connect your failures to your identity. He's going to try to confuse it and distort it. In fact, you read through the Bible, you spend time in the scriptures, you're going to see people who are struggling with their identity all the time. Moses, whenever God is saying, I want you to lead my people, he's like, I can't do that. I'm not a good speaker. Whenever Moses is gone, he goes to, he goes to Joshua and says, I want you to lead my people. He's like, I can't do that. I'm not Moses. You know, who, who do you think I am? He goes to Jeremiah and says, I want you to be one of my prophets. He's like, what are you thinking, man? I'm, I'm just like a child. I can't, I can't do this. What, what the enemy does is he ties th those things to us, and we start to think of ourselves in that way. And so we start to think things like, well, I'm just an addict, so I, I, I might as well just do it again. I, I've never been good with money, so I might as well go shopping again. I'm just not a disciplined person. I've never been able to be consistent. I've never been able to have those things, so I, I, might not, I might as well not even try. I've never been good at relationships, so I might as well just stay alone and by myself. I'm, you know, I, I'm just a bad dad. I'm never going to be able to love my kids the way they need to be, so I shouldn't even try. And what this does is we begin to think these things, and we start to buy into this, at least to what psychologists call a, a fixed mindset which is this negative cycle, just notice it, to where an unhealthy identity creates unwise habits and unwise habits reinforce an unhealthy identity. Think about it. Unhealthy identity creates unwise habits, so you start to do things, and you do those things, those unwise habits, which reinforces your unhealthy identity. It's just a vicious cycle, and we believe we'll never be able to overcome and so this year, let's do something different. It's a new year, new possibilities. And so instead of starting off with what the things that we want to do, like I, I want to lose 20 pounds, let's start off with a who goal and not a do goal. Let's start off with that. Here's the question. Who do you want to become? Okay, a do goal is I want to lose 20 pounds. 
A who goal is, I want to become a healthy person. And then the why behind it is, because I want to be able to get down on the floor and play with my kids and my grandkids. You know, a, a do goal is, I want to eliminate all of our consumer debt. Um, the who goal is, I want to become someone who is able to be generous at the drop of a hat. Okay? Um, I, I want to be able to spoil my grandkids and not leave them a credit card deal, uh, bill. Okay, that, that, that's what I want to be able to do. So the question is, who do you want to become? You know, who do you want to become? It's like, I, I want to become a true man of God. I want to become a godly dad, a godly husband, or you know, a God, I want to become a godly uh, woman, a godly wife, a godly mother. I want to be a, a bold witness at school or at work. I want to become someone who is sober, who is clean, who is f um, healthy emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And you think through it, and you just ask yourself this question, how would you want people to describe you? Or maybe a better question is, how do you want to describe you? And here's what happens. Whenever you start to get a picture of who you want to become, that will shape your actions. Let me illustrate it like this. Let's say you're trying to stop smoking, trying to stop um, vaping or lighten up joints or whatever it is, and someone says to you, do you want a, a cigarette? And you say, no, I'm trying to quit. What you are doing, listen to me, is you are identifying yourself as a smoker. I am a smoker who is trying to quit. If, on the other hand, you can just tweak it just a little bit and say, no, I don't smoke anymore. Your identity is saying, no, 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 that was a part of my past, but this is who I am now. That's my past, not my present. And it's just a small little shift there, but that change in identity can change your actions. Now, you may say, Turner, listen, I've tried all this before, but this is just who I am. I can't change. Well, if so, then I would say to this, you need to memorize Romans chapter 6, where it says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Who are you? You are in Christ. You are forgiven. You are a child of God. You have been redeemed. You are an overcomer. That means you are not a victim. You are an overcomer. That is who you are. And here's the bottom line. Do overflows from who? And another way to say it is this. When you know who you are, you know what to do. But the do will overflow from the who. So here's my challenge to you this week. In your bulletin, you should have gotten one of these handy-dandy uh, half sheet of paper because sometimes we need something tangible in front of us uh, to be able to put some things embedded into our brain. And on the front of it, it just says, who do you want to become? And on the back of it, it says, I am a person who. And I want you to spend some time today, this week, and just wrestle with this and ask yourself this question, who do you want to become? And then on the back, I am a person who, and, and write a sentence uh, write a sentence, write three sentences, write four, write five, but write at least a sentence of, I am a person who, and just start to fill it out. So for, for, for me, uh, 2024 is the year that I turned 45. And uh, for some of you, you're just like, oh, you're such a baby. Um, you know, it's like, I got Tupperware older than you, boy. You know, it's just like, um, there's others of you that are just like, oh my gosh, He's so old. Like, do they have a succession plan in place? I mean, what's going to happen? <laughs> it's just, just fun. But, um, but for me, 45, uh, it, it really just kind of crystallizes some things for me. Like, uh, for, for me, this is how I, I view it. Now, the Lord can do whatever the Lord wants to do, all right? But for me, the way I look at it is I feel like I've got 30 years of hard running left, Okay. Um, I, I want to run hard for 30 more years. At 75, then we'll evaluate, you know, how, how, what kind of pace I want to keep. But 30 years. And so with that being the case, I look forward and I fast forward and say, at 75 years old, what do I want people to say about me? What do I want to be true of me? Who is it that I'm wanting to become? And, and like some of the sentences I scribbled down is like, I, I want to be more in love with Jesus at 75 than I am at 45. I want to be more in love with his church at 75 than I was at 45. 
I, I want to be a guy that people look at him and they go, oh my goodness, he's still crazy about his wife. He's got his walker out and he's chasing after her, you know, and <laughs> still flirting with her. I, I, I want people to go, man, that's a, that guy's a great dad. He's a great pops or pop pop or bong bong or whatever it is that they, <laughs> whatever it is that they end up calling me. You know, that, that is a guy that because he knew he wanted to run hard for 30 more years at 45, he took care of himself physically, emotionally, spiritually. That he is incredibly generous with his friends, with his family, with his church. And that I know that for me to become that, there are things I'm going to have to continue to add, faithfulness, habits, rhythms, disciplines in my life to ensure that I'm able to become the person that I desire to become at the end of the day. Who do you want to become? That's the question. Now, if you, if you want an easy answer, and I, I, maybe I should just take this one off the table for you, but I'll, I'll let you do this one. We're at church, so we could give the Sunday school answers. Who do you want to become? I want to become more like Jesus. I mean, really, that's the, that's the bottom line. I, I just want to become more like Jesus, more and more like him. More loving, more caring, more graceful, more generous, more faithful. But here's the thing, and I'm spoiling the end of the sermon series for you. You will never do this in your own power. You will only be able to do this through the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. Whenever you give your life over to Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of God, the one who died on a cross for your sins, was buried, and he was raised back to life so that we could have hope so that we could have eternal life, so that we could have the gift of the, the Holy Spirit, so that we could become the best versions of ourselves and fully maximize all the potential that God has placed in our lives so that we can make the biggest impact for his kingdom on this earth. It only comes when you surrender to him. And so if you're watching online or if you're in the room and you've never made a decision to unite yourself with Jesus, to make him Lord of your life, and if you don't want to wait until week four to say, I want the power of the Holy Spirit living in me, today's the day that you can do that. Um, if, you're on, if you're online, you can visit corinth.cc slash decided and fill out that form. If you're in the room, you grab that connection card and you say, today's the day I want to begin a relationship with Jesus and I want to become more like him. So, Father God, we thank you so much that you are a God who gives new beginnings and new possibilities. And as we look out at this new year, we uh, pray, God, that you would be stirring things up in our hearts and our souls and, and leading us in the direction to where you want us to go. Because we know who we want to become, God, but if it is apart from you, then our desires are not right. And so bring our desires into line with who you want us to be. And then give us the strength and the power and the discipline to be able to do it. And we ask that in Jesus' name, amen and amen.